moving over to the website was just the natural progression of this. It's really, you know, from basically joining somebody else's garage sale to having your own boutique is, is really the difference. Welcome to Honest Ecommerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. I'm your host, Chase Clymer. And today, I'm welcoming to the show Jeremy Shepard. Jeremy is the founder and CEO of one of the largest Pearl brands in the world, PearlParadise.com. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chase. It's great to be here. And good morning. Oh, absolutely. So though it sounds obvious, can you let the audience know the products you guys are currently selling online? Sure. We sell pearls. Pearls, uh, loose pearls, pearl jewelry, necklaces, earrings, bracelets, um, all types of pearls. Um, there are several genres of pearls, saltwater, freshwater. And within those genres, there are quite a few different types of pearls. And uh, we carry all of them. So the full gambit. That's amazing. Now, take me back in time. One doesn't wake up one morning as a child and go, I want to sell pearls as an adult. Where'd this come from? You know, um, I did kind of happen into it. It was uh, not intentional, of course. Um, I was a flight attendant. I was a flight attendant for Northwest Airlines. And um, I was always sort of a serial entrepreneur growing up. I had several small businesses. But um, as a flight attendant, I, I traveled a lot, and obviously. And I had layovers in Asia and Japan. Pan and Tokyo, uh, Tokyo and um, China, specifically Beijing. And I had these layovers because I, I speak Japanese. Um, I, I speak actually a couple of different languages, which is why I got the job as a flight attendant. But that put me on these routes to Asia a lot. And one day on a layover in Beijing, China, I went to uh, a place called Hongtao Shirtang, this, this market, if you will, where they sold... Um, you know, everything from your knockoff North Face jackets to electronics and an entire floor of pearls. And um, I bought a strand of pearls for uh, my girlfriend at the time. Didn't know anything about pearls. And this is in the late 1990s. And I brought them back to the States. She got them appraised after I gave them to her as a gift. And they appraised for about $600. And I had paid about $25 for that strand of pearls. And so, of course, light bulbs started going off in my head. Like I said, I was a bit of a serial entrepreneur. And I thought, okay, there's got to be a way to build a business around this. Not knowing anything about the jewelry industry, pearl industry or jewelry industry in general, I started knocking on doors, you know, talking to jewelry shop owners, talking to boutique owners. Um, I had this idea in my head that as a flight attendant, I flew around the U.S., every day, you know, several days a week. And I could literally go to store to store to store to sell these pearls. I thought it was going to be super easy, right? But I didn't realize that, you know, the the jewelry industry is, is a bit insular. And the stores that, you know, the brick and mortar stores that uh, are all over the United States are typically generational type stores. You know, their parents owned it or their parents before them owned it or their stores that have multiple locations. And they have a very set supply chain, if you will. I mean, they don't just sell pearls. They sell diamonds, rubies, emeralds, you name it. And so they get their products from uh, companies primarily on consignment, most of them. And um, this new guy coming in, this flight attendant with a with a flight bag full of pearls, um, just got nowhere with these guys. So I was feeling a little bit down, thinking I had this great idea that looked great on paper that wasn't really going to work out. And a friend of mine called me and uh, he told me, Jeremy, I, I think I know where you can sell these pearls. And he told me about this website that he'd been selling some pearls on. And at this time, I didn't even have a laptop computer. So, I, you know, Internet was beyond my comprehension. He was selling stuff on eBay. I'd never heard of eBay before. And so um, I said, okay, this is something I can do. Um, you know, I'll put these products up on eBay and see what happens. So I did. I, I put up an auction. I put up a Dutch auction. 
um, for the exact same strand of pearls that I had bought for my girlfriend. When I say the exact same strand of pearls, I'm talking about the appraisal. Remember, I didn't really know anything about pearls. So I'm like, okay, this is what I have here. And this is the value. And I'm offering it for, I think I offered it for 60 or $65 uh, a strand. And it was a Dutch auction. So I put that uh, I had about 50 of them in stock. Cashed my paycheck, took all the cash I could out of my credit card, went to the airport, jumped on a jump seat back to Beijing. Because as a flight attendant, you can fly for free on your days off on the jump seats. Went back to Beijing, went back to the pearl market, went back to the same woman that I bought that first strand of pearls from and said, okay, you remember me from a couple of months ago? This is what I bought from you. I need to buy as many of this exact same color, quality, size as I can with this amount of money. And by the time I got back to the US, the Dutch auction had closed and 100% of what I had listed had sold. So for the next couple of years, I started putting auctions weekly on Amazon and on eBay. Back in the day, Amazon had Amazon auctions similar to eBay, and then they went to Z shops and then they did the whole, you know, what they're doing today. Uh, but that was my business for the first couple of years, just Amazon and eBay before I built a site in 1999, 2000. Oh, that's amazing. Now, obviously, you're offering a product on eBay for a tenth of the appraised value. Did you start to raise the rates on that as you started to see these sell-throughs? Well, first, I would say that uh, that original appraisal, um, I don't think it was very accurate. Okay. I think the value was probably more around, along the lines of three or $400 or something like that. Because, of course, as I started selling it. I saw other retailers selling similar products. And I, I, I realized that the original appraisal I'd gotten was a bit high. Um, but there was still a big delta between, you know, where I was, what I was paying and, and what I was able to sell them for. So no, I didn't, I didn't raise the price. And part of the reason I didn't was because it was, it was really successful. And yeah, it may seem like a lot to go all the way to Asia, you know, buy the pearls, bring them all the way back and, and have uh, you know, a margin of, you know, $40, $35, $40 per piece. But I was flying for free. And I was staying in hotels in Beijing for basically free because I had interline crew rates and I was doing that every month. So um, it was like I was my own importer. I was my own buyer. There was nobody else involved. And as a flight attendant, it went from making, you know, a paycheck after taxes of maybe eight hundred to a thousand dollars every two weeks to start selling pearls and selling thousands and thousands of dollars a month. I was more than satisfied at the time. That's amazing. All right. So let's walk me through where, you know, pearlparadise.com comes from. Was that the first name of the business, the first dot com? That was the first dot com. So um, my brother started selling pearls as well. Um, he had more of an IT background. He's a computer software engineer. And um, I, I, so I started buying pearls for him to sell as well. And he was selling a little bit on Amazon and eBay. And then he built a little website. And it was just a one page website. And for me, that would be almost like building a, a a rocket engine or something like that today. I had no idea how to do this, right? And uh, so he built this website, this one-page website, and then he added a link in his Amazon auctions to his website. And the first day he put up an auction, a featured auction, he got almost a thousand visitors to his website. And that's where I realized, okay, um, I need to have a website here so I can do the same thing. So Pearl Paradise was born end of 99, beginning of 2000, sometimes somewhere right around that time. And believe it or not, um, I used a platform, you know, I'm going to say similar to Shopify today and only similar in that it's very easy to use. In other words, it was sort of point and click. I got to build it myself by moving the blocks around. I had a film camera. I would actually take pictures of the pearls. Then I would take the film. I would get it developed. I took the pictures over to Kinko's, scanned them onto a floppy disk, brought the disk back to my house. And that's how I built the site. So it took me about two weeks to build the site. And uh, if you ever looked at Internet Archive, uh, archive.org to see what the site looked like in 1999, 2000, um, you would look at it and say, how in the world did anybody ever buy anything from you? Well, back then, you know, you were just cool if you had a website, right? Because back then there were even books called the Internet Yellow Pages. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, you could buy these books that had all the websites in the world, basically. And 
And then there was volume two. Well, this was, you know, 1990s, 2000. So it was like, if you did build a website, yes, people did beat a path to your door. It doesn't work that way anymore. So, you know, in 2000, it, it, it um, 1999, 2000, I think right around, right around the new year. So that's why I, I can't remember exactly when it actually went live. It went live. And um, about two weeks later, um, I, I had the first sale on the site. And uh, a couple months later, um, things really started to gain some traction. So I stopped posting auctions on Amazon on eBay and eBay. And for the last 23 years now, um, I've strictly been selling on pearlparadise.com and in our showroom here in Los Angeles. All right. So with the Pearl starting to move on your own website, what was the reason behind going all in there and abandoning these other proven marketplaces? Um, well, it was a lot easier. I mean, there's, you know, it's, there's not um, constant uploading of the auctions. Um, and we just started selling more. I just started selling more on the site than I was in the auctions. The auctions were starting to lose their luster, for lack of a better term, in that when I first went on eBay and Amazon, I was the only one doing it. And after I started having success with it a year or so later, there started becoming a lot of other sellers. And then it opened up internationally and um, it just got over overrun. And so, you know, we know I could no longer post an auction up that would, you know, sell 50 to hundred units at a time and, and generate the kind of traffic that it did um, just a couple of years prior and so moving over to the website was just the natural progression of this it's really, you know, from basically joining somebody else's garage sale to having your own boutique is, is really the difference. Oh, absolutely. So you have this website built in the early 2000s and you're selling pearls online. Tell me, you know, try to compress 20 years of selling online into uh, some highlights for us uh, as the internet evolves, as digital marketing evolves, as commerce in general evolves. Like, what, what are some of the highlights from this amazing journey? Well, one of my favorite phrases is, um, you know, innovate or disintegrate. And I would say that is pretty much would be the title of my career really for for pearl paradise um technology has changed so dramatically in the last 20 25 years as everyone knows and so keeping up with that technology keeping up with seo keeping up with you know digital marketing has is is a is a constant job and so what I did in 2005 versus what I'm doing now in 2023 there's there's really no almost no correlation. In, in 2005, for example, SEO was really about getting links to your website. So I would spend hours and hours every day finding these other websites that I thought were related to mine and, and you know, trying to get keywords in place. You know, I remember one of my biggest successes was getting number one ranking on Google for the term pearl jewelry. That took me months, you know, contacting probably a hundred plus websites and using the anchor text pearl jewelry to get there. The biggest shift, though, that happened was in 2005, and I'm looking at my wall so I can see the article. Um, 2005, the Wall Street Journal profiled me, um, profiled what I was doing. Um, and um, I was on the front section of the marketplace, the front page of the marketplace section of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and the moment that hit the newsstands, we went from being a company that was doing maybe three or four hundred thousand dollars a year um, to um, several million instantly overnight. So PR has been the biggest boon to the business. Um, and after that, you know, I, I, I interviewed with New York Times, USA Today, Entrepreneur Magazine twice, Inc. Magazine, Fortune Magazine. Um, I took a, a photographer and a writer from um, the Financial Times to a pearl farm in, in the Philippines. So really, I built my business by, by putting myself out there. Um, and um, with, with, with publications, you know. Um, and I also built the business by creating an educational website. And since I've actually created two now so far. 
The first one was called Pearl Guide, pearl-guide.com. It's Pearl Guide News and Forums. I built this in 2004. And um, that was the year that the term social media was even was coined. It was coined in 2004. And that's when I built my first social site. So Pearl Guide today, it still has about 10,000 members, about maybe a quarter million different pages of content on it. And it's active every day. There are probably 100 uh, people that are on there posting and interacting every single day. Um, and the next educational site I built was called Pearls as One, which was basically an online pearl specialist certification course. And I partnered with the Culture Pearl Association of America to build it. I built it in 2016. Um, I hired a team of translators. We translated it into 10 languages. And as of today, we have about 93,000 students that have taken the course um, around the world. So really, I built this business on PR, um, education, and, and building an authentic trust relationship with, um, with our customers and, and the general public. Absolutely. And not to mention, you know, SEO from all this content is really driving a lot of that organic growth. Now, I have to ask that Wall Street Journal article drops and, you know, 10x is the business. What breaks? The website. Website broke that day. Yeah. The website broke the day the Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, people don't really realize this probably, but uh, back in, it, gosh, maybe just even 10 years ago, not even 10 years before Shopify. Um, if you got too much traffic on your website or too many people trying to check out at once, your website crashes. So our website crashed um, probably in the first 30 minutes to an hour, but we were able to get it back up. And um, I don't know how much we sold in that first day, but it was probably a few hundred thousand dollars, probably as much as we had sold the year prior. Basically, it wiped us out of everything. But again, not a big deal because all I had to do was get on an airplane, go back to China and, you know, restock the pearls and bring them right back. So, uh, yeah, I would say one other thing almost broke, and that was our credit card processing. Um, our credit card processor processor um, reached out and said, hey, why are you processing so many credit cards right now? This looks like fraud. And I had to convince them that this article that just happened in the, in the Wall Street Journal was a big enough PR piece to actually create that amount of traffic on the website because um, they came on pretty aggressively saying, hey, we are going to hold your funds for up to 365 days because we believe this might be fraud. So those are probably the two biggest things. But I was able to work my way through both of those. I got the funds released. We got the website back up. So nothing catastrophic happened. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about a partnership we've had at the agency for years. Electric Eye and Recharge have been partners for longer than I can remember. Recharge is our go-to solution for clients when it comes to subscriptions. At Electric Eye, we know the ins and outs of Recharge. For example, we've set up replenishment subscriptions for consumables, created countless subscribe and save campaigns, and most recently, we got a client into a Recharge beta program to utilize Recharge's dynamic bundling solution for subscriptions. We've partnered with Recharge to solve subscription, loyalty, and membership for a day diverse range of clients spanning industries like food and beverage, automotive, supplements, CPG, and beauty. Not only is Recharge an incredible partner, they've been paving the way for subscription solutions longer than anyone else in the game. The product is unmatched, giving them a massive advantage against the competition. Clients often come to us because they've struggled to find agencies that truly understand how to harness the power of Recharge. We're not just familiar, we're bona fide Recharge experts. It's one of our specialties. It's a pain point we're happy to solve. As a top-tier Recharge expert, we have unparalleled access to support and resources that ensure we'll have a successful outcome. We stay appraised of all their new feature releases and compatibilities, bundling, memberships, flows, you name it, we know it. So. If subscriptions, memberships, or loyalty are on your to-do list and you're ready to have it done, just let us know. Visit electriceye.io slash recharge today to learn more about how we can tailor Recharge's robust product to your specific needs. That's E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E-Y-E 
rechargeyourbrain.io slash R-E-C-H-A-R-G-E. Let the experts at Electric Eye get it done the right way the first time. Join the ranks of our satisfied clients who partnered with us and recharged to harness recurring revenue within their business. All right, I want you to picture this. You're an e-commerce merchant juggling multiple platforms to manage your email marketing, SMS campaigns, and product reviews. It's a time-consuming and costly ordeal. But with Sendlane, those days of chaos are long gone. Sendlane brings together the power of email, SMS, and reviews all in one convenient place. So you can say goodbye to the hassle of separate tools and hello to simplified operations, increased efficiency, unified customer experience, and huge savings. And I haven't even gotten to the best part. With the all new free Sendlane reviews, you can leverage social proof to build trust and credibility with potential customers. Let me say that again, free product reviews. With Sendlane, you pay for email and SMS and you get reviews for free. Sendlane understands that customer feedback is essential for the success of any e-commerce business. That's why they've made an integral part of their platform without any additional cost to you. By unifying these key components of your tech stack, Sendlane helps you save time and money all while generating more revenue. Don't let your e-commerce tech stack hold you back. Embrace the unifying force of Sendlane and take your business to new heights. Sign up today and experience the power of streamlined operations, increased efficiency, and revenue growth. Visit sendlane.com slash honest to learn more and schedule your free consultation with a Sendlane expert. That's sendlane.com slash honest. And now, when did you stop being the person to fly to China and get the product? Are you kidding, Chase? That's the best part of this job. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't fly to China um, so much anymore. So back in, you know... Uh, the first time I went there, I think it was 1996 is when I bought the strand of pearls for her. That was Christmas in 96. So I started selling in 97. That China is just where freshwater pearls come from. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned, you know, we have uh, South Sea pearls, Tahitian pearls, Akoya pearls, Fijian pearls, Mexican pearls. And so it required travel all over the world. Um, I'm actually leaving for Hong Kong. My wife and I are leaving in just over two weeks. Uh, on the 16th. So um, it slowed down quite a bit during the pandemic, but really for the past 20 plus years, I've been traveling three to five times a year, I would say, um, internationally. And so I don't manage the operations so much anymore. I mean, you know, I have a team here that manages the operations, all the fulfillment, a team of stringers, a team of designers. I still get involved in the virtual appointments, especially for the really special pieces. And when I say special pieces, um, we had a set of strands that ranged in price from about 150,000 to just about $1.6 million. And there were only seven of these strands. These are museum grade, giant Wilma Flintstone South Sea strands. So for those sort of appointments, I'm always either my wife and I are the ones who are, who are taking those appointments. Um, but I love what I do. And um, and so I am still fully, fully involved. Absolutely. Still sourcing the product yourself, still traveling, meeting, making connections, setting it up, and then letting your team deal with, you know, the continuance of the relationship. It really has to be me. Um, I, um, like I mentioned before, I speak Japanese. Um, I was Mandarin. I was uh, Berlitz trained in Mandarin Chinese. And... All the people we work with, I mean, these are relationships, you know, that, you, that I built over the years. And so when I when I do go to Hong Kong um, in, in two weeks, it's not to source pearls from a company in Hong Kong. There's a big international show. So we have pearl producers coming from Tahiti, Indonesia, the Philippines, Australia. I mean, all over the pearl producing areas of the world, they congregate in Hong Kong three times a year. So during that week we're in Hong Kong, we are going to be having dinners every single night, probably lunches, you know, several times during the week. And these are with the, the suppliers. And so that maintaining that relationship is, is really important. And you can't very easily hire someone to become a buyer and travel in place of you to maintain and hold those relationships that I've built over the past 25 years. Absolutely. And it, it you can hear your passion. It's like, that's the, actually the thing I like to do. And so it seems you've almost delegated everything else off your plate now to the thing that you are obviously built to do. This is the number one thing that you... The value you bring to the business. 
A hundred percent. With pearls, there there is no grading scale. And, and I, I'm saying it this way because if you look at our website, you'll see a grading scale. You'll see a page about grading. But what most people don't understand is that it is a hundred percent subjective with pearls. You've got diamonds. Diamonds can be graded by GIA. They can be graded by EGL. You get a certificate that tells you the cut, the clarity, the the uh, you know all the quality attributes of that diamond. Then you match those quality attributes against a list like the Rappaport price list, and you know approximately what the wholesale price is, the cash wholesale prices of that stone. And then it really just comes down to how much you're going to pay as a margin. Okay, these are people that really know how to buy diamonds. That's the way you buy diamonds. And so when, like when friends of mine come to me and say they want to get engaged, I help them buy diamonds this way. Um, but no, I'm, I'm not in the diamond business. So please don't contact me for diamonds. <laughs> you can't do that with pearls. And when I say you can't do that with pearls, what I mean is that there is no set um, grading criteria. So what one person could call a triple A pearl, for example, which is the highest grade we carry, could literally be the lowest grade at another company because the grades themselves only mean something to the people that are selling them. Comparing two companies grades side by side is completely apples to oranges. And so you cannot shop by price and grade alone. You have to actually shop by the person doing the sourcing. In other words, it all comes down to the way the pearls are sourced. And because I've been doing it for 25 years, when I look at a strand of pearls, you know, I can gauge the shape. I can gauge the percentage of the roundness. I can gauge the luster. I can gauge the surface quality. I can gauge the color. You know, I can, I can gauge the tightness of the nacre. And, and my wife travels with me as well. And she's been a professional pearl buyer for 15 years now. Um, she started buying with me 15 years ago. And this is something that we are two of the top experts in the world at. And so really, it would be impossible for us to train anyone else to do this because they would literally have to know the product as well as we do in order to make the selections and do the buying when they're traveling. Let's talk about uh, how things are today. You know, what what is a typical kind of month for you as far as what's the marketing initiatives? You know, what are the big uh, items on the to-do list? So um, I, I always have a lot of projects and, I, you know, there, there are small projects and there, there are big projects. In terms of marketing, you know, we do a lot with email marketing. Um, we, uh, we have a big presence on Instagram, uh, a big presence on Facebook. We do a lot of Facebook ads. We do a lot of Google ads, you know, the traditional marketing. Um, and we spend a lot of, put a lot of focus on conversion rate optimization on, on the website. The biggest shift that we've had, um, well, before this call, I was telling you about a pretty big shift that we had in May when we basically did a revamp of the entire site. Um, you know, we tested out some new navigation, um, a, a new landing pages, new educational pages. And um, we launched that in May and it's been amazingly successful. Our conversion rate has jumped pretty significantly and our sales have increased nearly 50% year over year for that time period, May to today. The biggest change, however, um, was really something that happened because of the pandemic. And I, I'm, I'm sure you're probably hearing this in a lot of stories that, you know, these when the pandemic hit, you know, these plans that we originally had or things that we the way we were doing things before kind of shifted because the market shifted. And again, you innovate or you disintegrate. Right. And so during the pandemic, we had to shut down our showroom in, in Los Angeles. Um, and the showroom was really just for local people or people who were buying very high end pieces. They would sometimes fly in to visit our showroom. We didn't advertise in Los Angeles. The sign outside is really small. It's only on the outside of our door within the building. It's not on the outside of the building itself because we don't want people coming into our showroom uh, because we're primarily an e-commerce company. So we're shipping product all day long. Well, people could no longer come into our showroom. So we started, um, well, we started getting calls from people that said, Hey, can you, um, can you meet with me the way you and I are meeting right now, face to face over, over video? And, um, that had never happened before. 
Now, it's something that I, it was in the back of my mind for, for years thinking, you know, gosh, if there was just some way we could make this experience almost like a face-to-face in a jewelry store experience, it would change everything, right? Um, it would be such a better experience for the customers. Um, and it would eliminate that whole, well, I don't know if they're for real. Is there somebody behind that website? You know, will I get the product that I'm ordering if I, you know, lock down my credit card and uh, place this order? Well, during the pandemic, there was a shift in the way people in general communicate. And five years ago, nobody really knew how to do video chats. Nobody knew what Google Meet was, what Zoom was, what, uh, you know, all these other video, pl- uh, video chat platforms that are currently available today. They were either non-existent or they were used just for business meetings. But during the pandemic, that's how families communicated face to face. And so um, last year, Q4, the beginning at Q4, we invested in a, in a virtual showroom. And when I say invested in a virtual showroom, we contracted a team from Sammy's Camera in Los Angeles. Um, you know, they if you're familiar with Sammy's Camera, they, you know, they do all the Hollywood studios, et cetera, in Los Angeles. They're big, a big supplier of cameras and camera equipment. They set up a virtual appointment studio in our office and we launched this in Q4 and it has almost completely taken over our business. We have virtual appointments scheduled all day, every day, and um, we are getting close to almost half of our business coming from virtual appointments now instead of people just ordering directly off the website. And this wouldn't have been possible five years ago because nobody would have really understood how to, uh, you know, how to even do a Google Meet. Absolutely. Now, are these meetings for more of the higher end products? Is there kind of an inflection point? No, people can uh, buy a $100 pair of earrings or a $10,000 Tahitian strand. It, it, it doesn't matter. And obviously, those conversations, uh, those versus just a general purchaser online without the, the meeting, those conversions are through the roof. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Tuesday of last week, we had a 100% conversion day. That's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with, with, you know, our website, um, if, if we have a 2.5% conversion day, we consider that, uh, that a win. Um, but a hundred percent conversion with every single virtual appointment selling was, uh, was the first. That's amazing. Jeremy, you shared so much with us. Uh, I'm sure we could, we could keep chatting about things, but if there's anything that I didn't ask you about, is there anything that sticks out that you, you think would resonate with our audience? Anything you didn't ask me about that might resonate with the audience. Biggest secret, sign up for Harrow. Can you explain what that is for the listeners that haven't heard that before? And I'm saying this at the end because uh, because listeners would have to get all the way through this to hear this. Helperreporter.com. Harrow, helperreporter.com. That is my number one business secret. Uh, you're not familiar with Helper Reporter, Chase? Oh, yeah. I'm very familiar with it. So for those, for those that don't know, uh, this is a... Basically, it's uh, seeking sources for interviews, and the magic sauce behind this is is if you'll get an email, you'll sign up. I think these days you can even like trickle down on the what your your, your specialty is or whatnot. Yep. And they'll you'll just get emailed. I think it's once a day, um, yeah. maybe even twice a day now, three, three times a day. Yep. You'll get an email, and it's like, here are all the reporters that are asking these questions. Do you have answers to these questions, basically? And if you do, you just email the reporter, be like, hey, I'm so and so. Here's my bio. Here's my answer to your question. Now, if they like your answer, this is the magic. <laughs> tell tell them what happens, Jeremy. If they like your answer, then they call you up and say, "Hey, come down to the Fox News studios. We want to interview you." Or, "Hey, uh, you know, I'm from Inc. Magazine, and we're doing a profile. We'd like to include your quotes, so we'd like to profile you." Uh, I say it's my biggest secret because um, I, I, you know, I have about a 25, 30 percent hit rate when I when I respond to those. Um, but this is where the Wall Street Journal comes from. This is where the Financial Times comes from. This is where you know the New York. New York Times articles have come from USA Today. And so it is, it, it's not super easy. You know, it does take some practice to get your, your pitch, I would almost call it your elevator pitch cr- uh, crafted in just the right way to get people to respond. But once you do, I mean, there's your SEO, there's your PR, there's your traffic generation, and it's free. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, from the SEO perspective, it, oftentimes these are just articles that are going to end up on uh, news outlets, uh, but yeah. you're still going to get a backlink to your site. And Jeremy already shared this before. That's like one of the main components of SEO is getting yeah. links back to your site from other websites that are obviously going to be higher with domain rankings. This isn't an, an episode about SEO, but there's a little bit of secret sauce. Backlinks are good. Yeah. Yeah. Backlinks are really, really good, especially high authority backlinks. And a lot of these are high authority backlinks. So, so I don't respond to everyone that I can. I always check out what the company is. Sometimes they're anonymous or what the publication is um, and decide whether or not it's one that makes sense for me to respond to um, or not. Uh, you know, but I, I do read them every day, three times a day. The first one comes out at 2 a.m. So I read it uh, at about 5 a.m. when I get up. That's amazing, Jeremy. Uh, now, we've talked all all episode long about these amazing pearls. If I'm listening and that's something that's on my to-do list is to purchase pearls for someone that I love, where should I go? Pearlparadise.com. Take a look. If you want to set up an appointment, um, you can book a virtual appointment directly from the website there. And we'll be happy to help you out. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of that amazing insights about your business. I appreciate it, Chase. Thanks for having me. We can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own businesses. You can find all the links in the show notes. You can subscribe to the newsletter at honestycommerce.co to get each episode delivered right into your inbox. If you're enjoying this content, consider leaving a review on iTunes that really helps us out. Lastly, if you're a store owner looking for an amazing partner to help you get your Shopify store to the next level, reach out to Electric Eye at electriceye.io slash connect. Until next time.